accordance with board policy 2.230 <clears throat> members of the public who wish to offer in-person public comment are able to do so at this meeting to adhere to phase four guidelines there will be a limited number of seats available in the meeting in the meeting room the board president will call the public comment speaker to the podium based on the order in which the speakers sign in a sign-up sheet will be available at the entrance to the building six, until six o'clock in accordance with board policy 2.230 <clears throat> Members of the public will be allocated up to three minutes per speaker. The board president is set 30 minutes as the length of time for public comment section of the meeting. Members of the public may stay in the meeting space if the limited number of seats remain available. The board meeting continues to be live streamed for viewing on the district's website. Written public comments can also be provided where the board will acknowledge the written comment, but they will not be read. <clears throat> Links are available on the board docs. All right, so I'm going to uh, begin by calling, uh, uh, doing a roll call. So, uh, Margaret Harrell. Present. Karen Stufen. Present. Jim Collins. Present. Courtney Troutman. Present. Beth Hostler. Present. Chris Kaczynski. Present. Myself. So we have all seven board members present, and at this time I would ask that we stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so tonight we are going to revisit a conversation that we started in some ways last February when we started talking, and then we revisited it in November um, as well. You know, the board's, one of the board's jobs is to monitor performance. <clears throat> and so this is about monitoring performance. And tonight we'll be talking about the strategic indicators of performance, student performance. And we'll kind of do a recap of what we talked about in November. And then we're gonna hone in on what indicators we wanna use moving forward. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the administration and Okay, thank you, Kara. So you are correct, last fall we met. Uh, we had intended to schedule a follow-up meeting. That meeting has gotten pushed back several times due to the uh, unusual circumstances that we're all dealing with. But at that time, what the board agreed to, in principle, was to develop um, uh, KPIs, revised KPIs, that address uh, um, strategic indicators of student performance as one category. Um, there were also other categories that it wanted to address, but it wanted to start with the student uh, performance um, uh, as, as its first um, priority. And so that's what we're gonna try to agree to tonight. But also we're gonna introduce the concept of some of the other areas that you had talked about wanting to also have indicators for and get that process started so that we can start to come to agreement on what those might look like. Some of those other areas would include things related to finance and operations and some things that John Gata from ECRA is gonna talk about tonight. And then we wanna to come to agreement on the draft uh, student success indicators and the three areas that you wanted us to develop uh, metrics for were uh, academics, future ready skills, and student engagement. And so when we get to that part of the meeting, Marianne will explain what we came up with and, and why and how a little bit. Um, and hopefully we can come to consensus and finalize that portion of the conversation. The idea would be that we want to have all of these in the upcoming operational plan so that we can uh, be able to regularly report to the community how we're doing in, in the areas that we've identified as what we want to measure and communicate. And then also uh, be able to develop some focus areas for the upcoming school year so we can hone in and uh, agree to what outcomes we're looking for uh, based on the things that we want to measure and create a system where our school improvement planning, our professional learning, our resource allocation, and all of those things are targeted to what we all agree are what we want to be the priorities for a given school year. So 
that's sort of a review of the, the big picture kind of um, process that we're looking at. And so at this point, I will uh, turn it over to John uh, from ECRA, as well as uh, uh, one of his um, co-workers, Gina, is here tonight with us also from ECRA. So um, uh, go ahead and get us started, please. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, and thanks. Uh, it's uh, great to be here. It's great to uh, be back with the board and the administration. John, hold on it's one fun. second. We're going to get your part, your volume up because we, we're having some tech issues. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, thanks, Dave. It's great to be back uh, at Elmhurst District 205 to continue the, the work that was started last fall um, with the board around trying to identify uh, strategic indicators that can help the board uh, tell the district story, but also help the, the Board of Education govern um, the district through, through a well-defined set of metrics. And so uh, my plan tonight was to, and I'll go ahead and, and share my uh, screen here. Can, uh, can everybody see the PowerPoint that's up? Yeah, you're yes? good, John. Okay, good, great. Yeah. Um, so what I plan to do tonight was uh, refresh. I gave this presentation at the last meeting and I'm just gonna give it again in, uh, in really short seven or eight minutes just to uh, remind everybody about uh, the process, remind everybody where we are in the process, what tonight's goals are and then ultimately to um, start the facilitation um, around the other areas uh, that we might measure. Um, Dave mentioned that I am here um, with our uh, president, Gina Semenik, who will uh, help facilitate the conversation when we get to, uh, to that point. Uh, but we really have uh, two goals for tonight. So we wanna build on the prior work session um, that defines student success. And we're gonna talk about that as the second part of tonight of um, at, John, the, at the last you board, your presentation, last, your uh, PowerPoint in a presentation mode. Do you not see me advancing? No, you're 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 just in the PowerPoint. You're not in the presentation. Oh, really? Okay, let me. Uh, I am on mine. You know what? I'll uh, I'll share the whole screen instead of the window. Maybe that'll do it. How's now? Good. Much Good. better. So, um, so we have we have two goals for tonight. So, the at the prior work session, we talked a lot about uh, student success, and we talked about what that means um, in terms of uh, what students really need to be uh, developing within uh, Elmhurst District 205, and we provided some definition to student success that helped guide the. The administration in terms of coming up with the specific strategic indicators or key performance uh, indicators uh, and that's what will be presented on later on how that work of the board that shaped the definition of student success led ultimately to well-defined indicators uh, that will be used um, by the district moving forward to uh, to monitor progress but we also want to define uh, two to four additional constructs or additional areas that collectively represent the district's vision. I'm going to give you a little idea of what I of what I mean by that, and then we'll move to uh, presenting. Uh, Marianne will present the the draft strategic indicators that uh, resulted from the board session last time, mm -hmm. and then uh, and get some feedback on those. So as a reminder, what what are we trying to do here tonight, and and why are we developing strategic indicators? Well, it's it's really important to recognize that, you know, superficially school systems are all sort of in the same business, right? You're, you're, you're growing and developing uh, children. But, you know, as you go from community to community, the, the values are not all the same, right? And so every school district has their own story to tell. And, you, and every school district has a, a vision for the future and the vision for their school district and their vision for student success mm -hmm. Um, that represents the values of the community. And it's sort of the board's role as the representatives of the community to, to guard the vision and make sure that the vision is in the direction of the, the values of the community. 
And so going through this process of developing strategic indicators is the opportunity to make this vision come alive. It's the opportunity to make the vision more tangible, more observable. It's an opportunity to um, allow details of the, of the vision to be told through the strategic indicators. And so, um, but it's really about measuring progress towards the vision. That's what we're, that's what we're here to do. And so, um, but remember that as we're having these conversations, whether it's student success, finance and operations, community relations, um, think as a backdrop about the community, the values and what you've um, put in place at the district uh, in terms of a vision. And then if all things were working as planned within the district, what are a set of metrics that you'd like to see favorable movement on? And that, that's really what the work here um, is all about. Summary of the prior work that, that dealt just on student success from the prior board session, uh, the board defines student success really in three ways. That student success means that we need to be governing academic outcomes, we need to be governing future ready skills as defined by the six C's, and we need to be governing uh, student engagement. And if we have a collection of metrics that um, adhere to that definition of academic outcomes, future ready skills, and student engagement, um, then that should uh, allow not only the board to tell the story of the district, um, and not only allow the board to govern more effectively through these indicators, but provides a really clear direction to the administration in terms of um, the kinds of school improvement planning and the kinds of initiatives and the kinds of strategic priorities that have to be put in place to drive these outcomes. And so that's, uh, so that's the, the work that has been done and we'll, we'll hear a little bit uh, in more detail from, from Mary Ann um, uh, later in the agenda. We want to now do this exact same thing, but for additional areas. So we want to, we've now done the work of student success. What other areas define a high quality school system for uh, the Elmhurst community? So we have student success, but student success is only one part of the puzzle. So there, there, um, there are other areas such as the learning environment, finance and operations, community relations, right? That collectively uh, sort of define uh, how the board and, and how the stakeholders um, define quality within Elmer's uh, School District 205. And so that's really the work that we're going to start uh, in just a few uh, minutes here. Ultimately, the goal, you know, what's the end goal of this entire process? Ultimately, to have some sort of reporting or some sort of dashboard that is uh, comprised of the indicators that come out of this process that continually become part of the conversation and part of the story so that when you structure the conversation with the community or you're having conversations around school improvement or you're having conversations around priorities and what's working and what's not working, you come back to this framework to say, you know, what, what is working, what, is, what isn't working, what do we need to put in place to drive these outcomes? And that's, uh, and that's really what it's all about. And so the dialogue today is really gonna be focused on what areas beyond student success define uh, Elmhurst Unit School District 205. And at this uh, point, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, uh, Gina Semenik, who is gonna uh, lead the discussion along with me um, to help define these other areas um, so that uh, after this meeting, the administration has some sort of clear guidance on how to begin building metrics for these other areas, just like they did for student success. Okay, thanks, John. Um, so as he had just indicated, student success is that first sort of broad area. And what you see on the screen here is um, really, they're not default, but they're very common. There's generally focus and priorities around teaching and learning or learning and teaching, um, depending on uh, your preference there, finance and facilities or operations. Sometimes we see communication, a, a, a large broad area or, or something around just community in general. Um, this isn't a bad place to start. I think for the next five minutes, what I'd like to do, and it may be a little bit more difficult because we're remote. So I'll try to just, you know, monitor from, from afar if I can, but I'd like you to, since you're together there, support is to engage together in some dialogue around what are these big broad areas that would really capture our vision 
And there's no right or wrong, but some of them, you know, schools, these are common because it, the industry is such that they make sense. There's probably certain indicators around, um, you know, each of these, but you may find an area that isn't, you know, something unique to your district that you'd like to see represented by itself. So if we, we took five to 10 minutes, maybe at the most, have some discussion together as a board around, are these, do these additional three represent what we need or would we want to tweak them and call them something different or are there entirely different areas that you know aren't in front of us here and then um, maybe one or two can report back and and we'll take this this sort of is to get things started these will be the umbrella areas the real meaningful work is going to come in when um, for, for the remainder of our time to have you really identify within each of the areas and they you, you might find after thinking a little further you want to tweak them but let's start with the, the higher level and then we'll transition to some of the areas beneath it. But I'd like to see if we can get some agreement on you know, three or four additional areas beyond student success um, that you'd be comfortable with before moving to the next layer of what does it look like underneath each of these. And then one comment uh, before you get started, one of the things that we sent out that was given to you at the last board session that we sent it, um, uh, out prior to this meeting was um, a document of sample indicators. So if you're having our time sort of like, what do you mean by learning environment or finance and operations? Um, there's a document that you should have to kind of just um, uh, kind of stir your thinking a little bit and help you kind of get a, a sense of what other districts have done in these areas um, just to help, um, you know, sort of help you get moving uh, with your thoughts related to these areas. So we're going to go back, just to clarify, we're going to go back and, and kind of dive into the student success piece, like the specifics of that. Is that correct? We're going to end with that. Okay. So we're going to do the buckets first. Yeah, we're going, to, we're going to try to find out what else it is you want us to go forward with so we can do a similar thing and bring those back. Um, and then we will go through what we came up with for student success and try to come up with some agreement as to what what you would like to, if you're comfortable with that, or, or some possible tweaks for the final document so that we can take that off the table. Okay. Could you just, you or them, clarify or explain what learning environment is? That essentially is about um, future ready learning spaces, like, you know, our construction project, our facilities, um, the, uh, that, that, that is sort of a, a term that's used to separate facilities um, and related issues from um, finance. You know, sometimes we're, we mingle those together because it's always about approving bids for this or that or whatever. But that's a more, uh, that term is used to connote the, 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 the physical spaces, to put it in the context of that's where the kids are actually learning and not just talk about bricks and mortar per se. So would that be like yeah. furniture and tech or, or I don't, yeah, Margaret, go ahead. Yeah, well, and maybe it's, it's part of it too. So maybe that's part of it, how we um, define learning environment, because it certainly could be physical space. I'm also thinking about um, all the resources that go into learning, which include our teachers, our staff, mm -hmm. all of those different pieces. I think help make up that learning environment. So I, I, I was trying to see if we could broaden that and, a bit. And just to follow up on that, I also thought it was more, I thought this was the part that encompassed the whole student, like the whole child type thing, right? What else are they involved in? What else is making them, you know, like a representative of our students? Are they involved in extracurricular? Um, however, they involved in the community. That that was my understanding of learning environment. So if well, all I guess, those pieces, you know, fall under that. That's fine. No, you know what? As as I look at this here, um, John and I had a conversation uh, last week, and I took it to to understand that we were talking about something that was more related to our physical um, facilities. But as I see the indicators that they've come up with here as sample indicators. I obviously am mistaken on that. So Gina uh, yeah. or John, could you could could either of you walk us through um, uh, yes. what, uh -huh. what learning environment is and if we actually wanna talk about facilities, if that would be something we would wanna think about in terms of finance and operations? 
Yes, Dave, um, let me let me try to clarify a little bit. So finance and operations, given what I'm hearing, you might want to consider something finance and facilities. And that's where you can capture all the facility pieces. Teaching and learning environment, what we often see and that sample indicator page is not, we're not necessarily recommending those indicators. That's what we commonly have seen districts do under this sort of area. But rather than think of the physical space, because that might be better if we thought about calling an area finance and facilities, because you, you're right, a lot of times they go hand in hand and they're, they're more closely linked. Teaching and learning might be more of, think of organizational climate, think of employees, think of you know, parents, satisfaction, um, you know, job satisfaction, teacher retention, uh, professional learning, you know, that whole environment, what does that look like? It's think of more of the personality, the, the climate of the learning environment, and a lot of those pieces that are more people related might fit in there. So you might see some things around surveys, you might be tracking, you know, employee satisfaction or, um, you know, some survey around students, um, student levels of uh, or, or ratings of safety, um, more people oriented, if that helps. Yeah, that's fine. I'm sorry for the confusion then. We must have been, John and I must have been um, not on the same page when we had that conversation earlier. So um, I apologize that I misspoke. No, no, that, that's well, the, fine. Yeah, this the, other, is the, the thing that I would add too, though, is, you know, there's, there's nothing, um, well, these are the areas that we see a lot, and these are the general ways that districts have organized uh, their indicators. Um, it has to make sense for you in District 205. There's no, as Gina said, there's no right or wrong answer. So if you don't even like the, 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 the term learning environment, that's what we're here to talk about. Because mm -hmm. you really have to make sure that this represents your vision and what you're trying to create. We just, we just offer this as a framework to start the conversation because in our experience in doing this in a whole lot of places, um, some version of these is always present. There's, you always have student success. You have something to do with the learning environment, whether that's culture, climate, you know, safety, characteristics of the actual um, uh, learning, um, the environment in which learning is taking place. And then ultimately you have some, some finance and operational pieces um, and then usually some kind of external community relations. So, um, so I think from a process here tonight, I think starting with this level of grain first to come up with the major buckets and then we'll cycle inside of, of each one um, probably will be the most. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Gina and John, I really like the fact that I looked at your presentation and I think it's slide three. I had a better understanding of what you meant between student success and learning environment. And then I really like the indicator titles. Um, I, I, I think I, I grabbed six of, or five of those that I would see in a learning environment. So the way that I looked at it is, um, we always look at student success, every district does. Mm -hmm. But then the important thing for us, I think, based on my quality and process improvement professional background is, you wanna make sure that the organization and the environment to which your customer, the end student is successful, what's impacting their success or what's but our particular mm -hmm. obstacles. So that's how I saw it different for student success, which is the outcome for the student, but then it's the environment to which we produce for that student to be successful in learning environment. And so I highlighted um, some things in your indicator titles of highly prepared and effective educators, quality of education, satisfaction with staff PD sessions, student satisfaction, teacher evaluations, just to get a sense of it's not just the evaluations, it's the professional development piece of it where you know you, you, it, it's a feedback loop and it's, it's just like the kids are getting um, feedback you know, in order for them to continue to learn. You know, us and the adults in the system, that's a really good, that's what I'm familiar with in, you know, in my career is in organizations that you know, are looking to be great is they're always getting that feedback loop and you know, what do they need to be you know, effective, what's hindering them. And I think that that feedback loop and that process and the, that, uh, that uh, 
what we would do to help our people would have been very beneficial as we you know, got into this pandemic and changed the learning environment to remote you know, because that would have given us an idea and a structure, an organic structure to see what our people needed. And, you know, people are at different places and that's okay. The important thing for me on behalf of the organization and on behalf of our client, right, the students, is that we know what our people need so that they can be successful because then they'll feel good about themselves and then, you know what I mean? The, like it's it's how do we get the input as to what they need? So that's how I looked at it. That's what I'm familiar with in looking at quality and business process improvement um, as as a large organization. So that's what I would highlight, and that's what my recommendation would be. So what would you call the area? Would you call it learning environment? Well, so I was trying to think if, if we go back up. I was trying to see if maybe John, can you move your slides? Level, um, because I think initially we were trying to figure out what Again, our um, groupings would be, and maybe if we, you know, can start talking about. So there's this from what I'm hearing. There's some discussion about learning environment, what it is, what it what it means, and we can work through that and 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 go down deeper, Karen, like you did about the specific indicators. But if we can step back for a moment and maybe talk about um, what buckets, if we know student success is one, what mm -hmm. are some of the other ones that maybe don't require as much discussion and then delve deeper into those ones that do? So are there any ones on there on this sample construct um, that don't really require a deep discussion that we can definitely say that this bucket is in, not what's measured in that bucket, but that actual bucket um, makes sense and should be included. Yes, and that's our goal is to just come up with the top buckets right now and then we'll move directly into what's under them. Just like student success has three other priority areas, one around academics, one around future ready skills, and one around student engagement. We'll do that same process, but we want to just figure out what, and once we get there, it might, you might want to adjust what you're calling the bucket. That's not a problem, but it, we just want to try to get the area. So then you know how best to focus. So in my opinion, and I, I just want to say the most helpful part of the entire presentation of the documents you gave was working through those sample strategic indicator tiles, because I really do feel like it helps me understand all these different areas and you know i i looked at that yes. and i'm like i couldn't think of anything else that i um wanted to see help us understand how our students can be successful or how we decide you know assess whether they're be becoming successful and i i feel like these four you know big buckets incorporate most of the things we have talked about for the last year i don't I don't think there's any outliers of issues we've talked about that doesn't fit into one of these four kind of big categories. And like you said, then we get narrower, but there, I think it's a really solid start. Okay. Um, I agree, Courtney. I do like um, on the indicator tile sheet, it's communication and engagement. I kind of like that wording because um, it's community relations and I know that communication um, has been brought up. We know it's very important for us and for our community. So we, um, I just like that word communication being in there. That's just my personal opinion, but I do like the, the four that we have here. And we have had, I mean, that's common. We have had people- tend to fit into this? We usually see that with finance. Rather than finance and operations, I have seen more districts uh, leaning toward calling that area of finance and facilities. And as far as community relations, we've also seen not just community relations, you could call it communication and community relations. We've seen that too. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, it, so I'm hearing though that these general, um, these buckets, as, as, as we're calling them, um, while we could tweak the, the semantics of the names, they generally reflect 
um, what the district should be measuring. Is that, am I hearing that right? Yes. Are we ready to move on and, and drill into them? I think so. Okay. We're not so, changing so that, the name of finance and operations, are we? We're just adding facility. Okay. okay. That's up to you. And sometimes it's helpful to go to dive deeper first and then cycle back to the semantics back to make sure it mm -hmm. captures it. So uh, I would recommend let's dive, let's dive in to, to create a little definition of each one of them. And then if that definition doesn't quite match the title, then we can tweak the title. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm attempting to save some time and not um, uh, try to uh, drive the ultimate outcome of what you come up with. But I wanted to indicate that um, because you asked us to include student engagement as one of the three areas, I just want to remind you for student success, we have some of these things in the student success in that area so maybe as a way to streamline this so we're not redundant attendance rate is in student success currently well i mean currently because we had student engagement we had attendance rate there we had community service there we had extracurriculars there. We had sports there. We had um, um, uh, extracurricular activities there. So what I was thinking was when you take a look at some of these other things and you want to take a look at um, you know, the areas related to student satisfaction, student relationships, social emotional needs, we want to get social emotional in somewhere. Um, if you want to rearrange how we categorize some things, that's fine. But I just thought it might um, it, it might help the conversation be a little bit more efficient to remind you that some of these things have been included in the other area because you want it to see us reflect student engagement. So could I clarify, Dave? Are you talking about that that draft? December 2020 future KPIs document. Is that where you're, that's where you're listing them? Because um, I, I think I see everything you mentioned, but I, I, I missed a couple. Yeah, yeah, okay. it's, it's a draft, yes, yeah, it's that, that draft that chart, document, right. correct. Like, okay, yeah. And one way, the, the one so comment this, I would make too is you think- This bucket for this future about KPI, other areas the draft is. 2020, that's what we're calling um, student success. As, as of right now, yeah. that, that's, what we, that's what we had come up with. So if you want to move a few things around or adjust some things, we can. But if, if, that, if that helps the conversation avoid redundancy, yeah. that's all I was trying to do. No, I appreciate that because I don't, you know, I, I actually appreciate the fact that student success is not just tied to grades and, you know, assessments, that it's tied to the whole student. So the fact that these other categories, which, you know, may have been considered under learning environment are now under the student success. I, I like it. I mean, I, it, it's about the student as opposed to facilities or finance. So um, I, don't, I don't necessarily care what bucket they fall in. I just want them all measured so that we know where we are and where nothing's falling through the cracks. I just, it seems like for me, the learning environment piece um, could be, I know, to all of us, it's really important to get student feedback and to make sure that um, we are hearing from our students that they feel safe and supported and connected and um, that they feel successful. A lot of that goes back to the relationships and the culture and the building and that sort of thing. So I guess for me, that's more in my head. And then some of the pieces that Karen brought up as well, as far as like the professional development and the staff um, you know, satisfaction and um, the student satisfaction, the um, quality of the education and such um, from that perspective. But it seems like these are a little bit more of maybe the intangibles that are mm -hmm. the student feeling supported and how they're um, perceiving that experience for them. 
So I agree, Dave, that things that you have in the student success uh, bucket seem to belong there. Maybe this could lean a little bit towards some of those other things so that we're not being redundant. Yeah, and one way to think about this so, is... So now do we success. pick one of these and dive in a little bit? If, if you're comfortable with these three to move forward, I would say let's just start with, we can go, if you would rather work from the community slash communication bucket first, since it sounds like the learning environment might be um, the more meatier one that might take more time. Yeah, well, let's just go learning environment while we're- Okay. Then uh, you'd be trying to come up with some two to four, you know, again, broad enough areas that allows the administration to take them and then develop specific indicators. But you're looking at some indicator samples. So if they seem to thematically fit together, they would rise to some larger, you know, higher kind of a grouping. Um, that makes sense. Similar process for what you did with the student success. Perfect. So one thing that I noticed on the learning environment that I'd like to mention and is the school safety piece, um, but not just have it be uh, physical, like I feel like emotional and, you know, mental safety, however you articulate that. Um, and I don't really know how you would measure that, but um, I think it's important that, you know, kids and staff and, you know, feel both physically safe and um, mental, emotional safety. So that would be one that I would recommend. So to that, uh, Gina and John, I'm looking at your learning environment, and I'm thinking, Kara, along that same line, and there's two indicator titles. One is school safety, and one is student well-being. Um, but Dave, I didn't write down all those that you have in here, I mean, that you listed. I thought there were more than what was on this sheet. Um, I'm sorry, this other packet but I didn't see well-being on it. You said social-emotional, so that's why I was asking. Well, yeah, no, uh, well, I think that social-emotional is not included in the other, so I think that social-emotional um, might be something you wanna consider here for some of the reasons you've been talking about. Student well-being um, is, is not um, necessarily a category under that title, but when, when they use one of their qualifiers here as students reporting school engagement, school engagement is sort of one of the three big buckets included in the student success. So, you know, I, I'm wondering if you wanted to go with SEL and student and, and staff satisfaction related type themes, um, which you've been talking about, that would allow, that would allow to, to prevent some overlap um, but again, we, we can tweak these to make sure that you're comfortable with, with the actual product that we come up with here. So I guess I'm going to throw out there, because I'm kind of splitting hairs trying to figure out, I don't want us to go down the path of just the, and, and I'm going to use the wrong terms, probably Nikki, maybe Scott, uh, Kevin, Dave, but I don't mean any negativity toward it, but I don't want us to be measuring the, the SEL curriculum sort of thing, okay? I like the way that Kara was approaching it from the student well-being, which we might not know, and that's typically what you're trying to do. Although, why I'm bringing it up is that's always very difficult to measure and get an assessment of. So what, I'm, what I would be okay with is whatever is broader to really capture you know, our students' well-being, which is more important than ever, to balance it out with the academics. You know what I mean? That, you know, I want our organization to represent that balance um, versus you know, going through, and I like SEL, I just don't want us to be measuring something so minute that we miss the well-being. Right. So Nikki, can, you're can, shaking your head. Yeah. Can I, I just jump in for a second? Because again, I, if we're going to capture learning environment, can we just, before we get to the exact 
metrics, let's talk about the themes under learning environment that we want to capture. And I think there are some themes that came up before, like culture and climate and safety. So if those themes make sense, and maybe there's other themes under there that will make sense, then we can say what metric would cover it or would not cover it, you know, and we can figure out a good one um, or good ones <laughs> um, from there. But let's 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 still try to stay a little high level and do the like major themes that we want to be sure are included in that learning environment. I, I, I would agree. And then, as I said earlier, you know, Dave will take these, these themes, <clears throat> excuse me, these themes back to his team and they will develop a set of draft indicators to come back and have an additional discussion like we will in a little bit about the student indicator, student success. I hear safety, I hear well-being. I think when you think about the environment, you, you want to, it's an opportunity to be more inclusive because you have that whole student success area. You can be more inclusive to represent teachers to everybody. You know, safety is a big one. Having a, you know, themed area, something around safety, there's a number of things that can be looked at. You know, health and well-being of everybody, there's a number of things that the administrators will be able to identify, you know, around that. I think one one suggestion for so sorry Margaret you named three um, I believe so all right sorry I'm a soft talker um, so you you said safety what were the other two culture climate okay um, I I'm thinking like spectrum of opportunities you know would be like based you know availability of electives essentially you know a variety of different opportunities for kids to learn would be a good fourth leg of the stool there in addition. I mean, I'm in favor of student well-being, just to be clear, and you know, but I'm not sure how exactly we would measure that, but um, we'll get to that next. But I think that we should have a fourth one there on just, I, I think the community takes pride in offering a lot of different elective opportunities, especially as our students um, advance through the grade levels, so we should incorporate that as well. Maybe opportunities and resources. Um, might go hand in hand that they feel they have those available to them. Where does does professional development fit in this? Is this category or is that somewhere different? Or I think that would it's, probably be sort of under a staff satisfaction type metric. We have we measure that regularly, but um, that might be like a climate measure for staff satisfaction or something like that. It would definitely, yeah. It would definitely go under the learning environment. Yes. Mm -hmm. Could you repeat that, John? We didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? No, I was going to say professional development would fall under learning environment okay. somewhere. So that that would be five, right? I mean, one thing we have to be careful of, mm -hmm. right, is that yeah, if everything is a goal, nothing is a goal. So, like, even the the student success list is quite extensive so we if that's well, five that's that's a lot so yeah john what i was trying to do with my comment was was maybe further the conversation about what the big bucket areas are i think it was very helpful last time when we had those three buckets absolutely so and i do agree that this will probably be the trickiest one to pin down the uh from a board perspective i'm not sure if they they would agree with that but if we get those three buckets, I think it'll be, we'll be able to come up with some indicators that I think you'll be comfortable with. Right. And so far I'm, I'm picking up on three sort of theme. You, you have a, a safety and well being theme. It's yeah. in, you have a culture climate theme, which are a little bit different, but I still think you could lump them together as one kind of theme. Um, and then I'm hearing something around diverse programming and opportunities, something about like, are there, um, is there a wide range of programmatic offerings by the district that give students opportunities to explore and engage and, and do the things that, uh, um, could you elaborate, really could you just give an example of, you know, climate versus culture met like an, something you would measure in each or how you would measure each of those. Jeannie, you want to take this one? 
Yeah, you know, so the culture is going to be more, it's more norms of, you know, how people should behave. That's usually driven by some pillars of, you know, your value statements and such. So I'd almost say, you know, culture is, is improbable. I, I would likely say go with climate here. Climate is going to be more um, within the organization, the people, and under climate, you, you could definitely put things like, um, satisfaction that could include professional development. Um, you know, it could include uh, engagement, retention, those sorts of things around the people, as well as students and, and even, you know, sometimes parents, we've seen, you know, parent survey responses go there if there's not another area like the community piece. Um, culture is really going to be more, you know, prescriptive of these are the norms of how we behave. That's generally you know, directed from the pillars or your vision um, statements, you know, what we believe. So as long as you have, you know, some value statements that that really describes your culture and that should drive people's sort of behaviors day to day. Climate are the things that you could do and change more frequently to, you know, cause change. If that makes sense. It's going to be easier to change climate than culture. So it's funny, right behind Dave, there is our beliefs that are listed down there, which I thought um, pretty much say what our culture is supposed to, what we believe our culture, what we want, what we aspire our culture to be. Um, so that might be, and I can't read them all, but there's a list of two, four of them that are, are right there. Um, that kind of give an idea of what our culture, our beliefs are. Yeah. So, and, and that's important because we've, we've done a little bit of work with this. Uh, Steve Grunert and, and a colleague wrote a book called, um, um, let's see here, Rewired, what is it? Uh, School Culture Rewired. And their work draws a distinction between culture and climate. What we could do if you want is part of this to, to, to provide clarity for everybody is just come up with a definition of those terms so everybody has a common understanding of what we mean by that. Because they are often sort of um, it, it used uh, uh, interchangeably and they're really not. So one of the things that's to correct. avoid that, I think that's good practice that we try to do with terminology is just come up with a common definition so we could do that as part of this if you want us to. Yeah, and, and, and I don't know, I can't, I don't, I'm not sure what those statements are, but I think in general culture, I would not chase culture to, to monitor and measure in annual to annual plans. Those are day to day, how people behave should be those, those, you know, the culture and those statements or beliefs should be deep within everybody and driving their day-to-day -day behavior. I would not suggest that you try to measure that the way we're trying to measure some of these other pieces. It's very much, it's more about, um, you know, deep-rooted norms. I mean, the closest thing I'd say is you'd look at policies that will drive specific, you know, things like that. But, um, for improvement and to, to make sure that you're measuring the things that you value, as long as your culture and those belief statements are present and people are sort of living and breathing them and they understand them and they should drive their day-to-day -day behaviors. They're kind, of the, they're kind of the pillars, the framework. And then within that, when we understand what we believe and what we aspire to be, things in your climate are what you're after to really, in your learning environment, think of the climate as the learning environment. When you walk into a building, what's the first thing you notice? Are you greeted kindly? Are you, or, or do you walk into an office and, and people are all busy, but they don't even look up to say good morning? That's part of climate. It's the personality. Um, are teachers satisfied? Are they coming back? Do they return to work? Or do you have, do you have a big, turn, a high turnaround? Do you have a drop in enrollment? Or is there, you know, people moving in because they love the district and what you stand for and they want to enroll their students. What are you known for? Um, we tend to see a lot of survey type of, of uh, data collected in this area because it allows student voice in a different way. And, and when we talk about the students in this bucket, it's not so much about individual student outcomes because as Dave said, most of that is captured in the student success bucket. 
but but you still need student voice about the learning environment and that that lends to how do they feel do they feel like there's you know they feel comfortable that sense of belonging do they feel safe physically in in the buildings um, if that helps to try to differentiate it but i wouldn't chase culture as a metric in this process i would just make sure that that you all agree and understand and that that's a separate conversation and i don't know what those statements say but that's really what sort of holds up your culture is what you stand for what are your value statements so just to recap then is it well-being and safety is that one i think that goes together another one John, would be climate and the third would be diversity of opportunities. That's that's what I had summarized here. Safety and well-being is one. Climate as as the second one, and either program opportunities, diverse you know program diversity, something to do with the the availability of opportunities for students. But if you leave it broader, John, I'm just throwing this out there. Diversity of opportunities could could include staff as well. Sure. sure. It well, becomes much I liked better. what Chris was saying, but to Margaret's point about the bigger picture buckets and then something specific, I know that you have quality of education, parent satisfaction. The definition that you have around quality of education is more the parent satisfaction piece. I would like Chris's diverse programming as one element that's the detail around quality of education because I think that's what we want to measure more is the quality of our education that we're providing in this learning environment for our students to be successful. One of which would be a programming. So that's what I would suggest. So if you were to draft and administer a survey to your families, um, you would be asking them about their level of satisfaction and one of them would, or, or ratings of quality, and one would be the quality of the education, uh, you know, satisfaction with the type or the, the diversity of opportunities and programs. I mean, if you can picture that as a larger area in administering a survey, you'd be able to get very specific with what you're, you really wanna understand how people feel. But I, I, I just have concerns that what you're trying to capture gets lost in that quality of education caption. Like I feel like like we're trying to narrow, right? Like we're at the process of narrowing it down and I feel like that broadens it. I don't know. I feel like when you're talking about safety and then climate and then the third one is quality of education, it might, in my opinion, just too broad and maybe I'm just not. Well, quality of education seems to almost be above the yeah. buckets, right? Like I feel like that's what we're trying to achieve with all of these KPIs. All of the areas, right. So. I mean, I like the diversity of opportunities or something. I, I like I like being families being able to know that we're trying to capture what's available, like that we're offering a lot and what's how our students are able to take advantage of that. I don't, just in my mind. So I just think. Well, there will be more underneath those things, right? These are just the broader topic and then they'll be working on metrics to um, things that'll fit underneath each of those, correct? I guess I'll keep it open and depending on where we get with it, I might disagree. I mean, the, like if I could interject for one minute, all we really need tonight is enough of a definition of these constructs that the administration can then take it and create metrics to bring back. So there's another round of this, of this process. And so, um, you know, I think if, in terms of the learning environment, if people feel comfortable that it has to do with safety and well-being, it has to do with climate, it has to do with the diversity of opportunities for students, um, that might be enough to, you know, to to have the administration, um, you know, take it and come back with a set of indicators. Because ultimately, the final set of indicators, it's not like they'll be organized by these. It, this is more about creating definition. I like the diversity of opportunities because it seems like more could fall under that. It's not just about programming. It could be about um, student programming, student resources, staff resources, staff 
professional development. Um, it could, a lot of things I feel like could fall under that. That's just my opinion. And when the administration comes back with their draft indicators, if there's something that's missing, you'll have that opportunity again to come back and revisit and make sure that everything is represented. Okay. Great. All right. That's, so uh... I think it seems like we're ready to move on to a, the next bucket. Yep. Mm -hmm. And are we going to keep it finance and operations or, or sure, did we'll you want to go in order? Well, oh. I see what you mean. The, the title, what it's called. Uh, you're asking about the title? Yes. Uh, finance and operations, finance and facilities. And I, I think, can we, we can always come back and wordsmith the names, right? We just want to get the themes mm -hmm. under it. So we'll leave it as finance and operations and see if we can do the same process and you can you know take a look back if it's not accurately representing what you came up with the the thing that i want to point out about uh this bucket is that we're going to use this conversation to refine the operational plan because our previous financial objectives that we were uh you using and that the board directed us at one point to use in the organizational goals that that um, uh, we have been focusing on ever since I've been here and possibly before are, are need to be refined because of our new accounting system anyway so when when what you come up with here is what we're going to use to import into the plan as a substitute for the the previous uh, system of how we sort of measured our financial status. So I just wanted to make sure I reminded people of that so that they didn't lose track of that. So I know that we talked a lot about for ever since you got here, Dave, is the academic return on investment. So where does that fit with here? Well, the academic return on investment, the goal was to try to get our program analysis uh, 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 work to become more sophisticated and evolve into a situation where we can attach budget lines to everything that we're doing and actually be, get a little bit more finite about return on investment. We, we've gotten a little bit better at the program analysis piece, which I think has been a step in the right direction, but we've never been able yet to get to that, you know, actually attaching all the different budget lines which includes hard and soft expenditures, and it's not really an easy thing to do, but it is possible. Um, that That's where we envisioned that going. Um, originally, the original operational plan several years ago had that kind of as part of finance and operations, but um, it's still, we, we, we sort of moved that to our learning and teaching uh, at, uh, work plan portion of the document because we haven't gotten to where we can attach the financial pieces to the to the measurement system yet. So I don't I'm, know if Mary Ann or Chris, I mean, you know, want to uh, add to that or if they're comfortable with what I just said. Can I, and I apologize, can I, if I can, um, to me that's, that's a, a very good one, but that's very specific. Like that might be a metric that we wanna measure. Can we go a step up and say, do the same thing we did with learning environment and say what some of the key themes under finance and operations that we wanna look at might be? Facilities, technology, and fiscal management, please. Thank you. What was that? I, I, I couldn't hear that. Yeah, it was soft. Facilities, technology, and fiscal management would be the three that I would suggest. Facilities, technology, and fiscal management. Fiscal management. It's a good start. Yep. 
Is there a second? Anything else come? <laughs> Third. Okay, the, the, the thing that I would like to say about that is when, when we come up with the ultimate way that we communicate this, we're trying to, we've been using for a long time the concept that technology is an accelerator of learning and not a driver of, of, of uh, pedagogy. Um, and I think that we've obviously made a lot of gains this year and, and um, we're hoping soon to get some, some data that supports that. But um, if we're using technology as part of facility and operations, I would think that that would be conceived of more of infrastructure and long-term planning, sort of the way you have a facilities master plan, and that we wouldn't be confusing that with technology being something that's unrelated to instruction, that, that we still maintain the fact that um, it's, it's intertwined with how we want the, the learning experiences to look and, and um, how it supports the actual learning objectives like rigor or like student agency or other things like that. I don't want to overcomplicate it. I just don't want it to be that technology is all about routers and servers and, um, you know, that kind of thing. Just like when we did the original operational plan, we wanted facilities to be about supporting learning, not just to be about bricks and mortar per se. So that's just my yeah. thought. So, or what it's worth. So what I had in my head there was basically three components for technology. The first would be learning related. Um, the second is usability for our community. I think we have some improvements that could be made there and just in terms of ease of use for several of our systems. And then the third would just be recognizing that it's a critical infrastructure priority. Um, you know, if we, <laughs> one of the th things we've learned is we need backup plans and we need those to work when we need them and things like that. So I feel like that should be monitored as well. So I would split tech into those three camps. Well, and I just, I think too, it is now part, just you really have to think of it like you do a facility in a way, like it is part of the, it supports the learning, it is part of the infrastructure and it has to have a long-term plan because, you know, like you have to keep replacing and upgrading and um, always be uh, planning for the future that you probably don't even know what it is yet, but you know you're going to have to upgrade and replace. What were the three things that you said again, Chris? Mm -hmm. Just yep. academic use, uh, usability for the community, and then just uh, critical infrastructure planning. Would you look at technology from two different perspectives, one under this bucket and one from the standpoint of metrics in our, our big buckets, back to Margaret? Because I, again, from my background, you would do two separate pieces, one of which Chris is saying, right, or you were saying of the infrastructure, but the other is from a an learning environment standpoint. So if you and your team you know, look at it like what it what are some of the metrics under like technology is a way for us to create a quality educational learning environment. Um, you see what I'm saying? Like, because yeah. that's what I would put under the quality of education. I would have the technology use utilization. Like I would even have a component if I were to have. Um, the next one is communications and engagement or community relations. To Chris's point from technology is the user interface to the parents or the students or even our staff. So, I mean, technology starts to cross everything you do and you wanna ask different questions in each one of those areas because that's how it then enhances your organization. And, and I agree, Karen. I think you and Dave and Chris actually said the, the same thing. I, I think we're, we've got those buckets. And yes, there are pieces of the technology, the pedagogy piece that help assist the pedagogy that will be picked up someplace else. But this big bucket, my understanding of this big bucket that we're talking about 
of you know technology, what might come under there, the infrastructure, the planning, the street that would include the strategic planning, the ease of use, um, all of those different things. Those are segments under how we're defining this technology for the organization, not for the not for the structure, the individual. Yeah, I think that. So here's here's what. I think we got a vision, we got a mission, we got belief statements. Within those belief statements and within the actual um, development of the school improvement plans and the professional learning that we do, we talk about personal, we, and we talk, talk, talked about this at different times in our presentations that this year we were trying to envision this to mean feedback, personalization of learning, rigor, um, and I think we might have had one other term in there that's eluding me right now. But what I would suggest is that what we would do is we would say, what are, what, what are the learning priorities? And those are reflected in the learning and teaching work plan. And that what we do is we build the technology um, master plan the same way we built the facilities master plan, but the technology master plan is built to support those learning um, priorities that we have. And so the relationship comes in between the, um, uh, the um, operational piece of technology that, that we outline here with the indicators that we outline here are related to what's in the work plan and the work plan sort of related to the vision. So I think that while that sounds very complicated, it, it's not dissimilar from what we're actually currently doing. It might be actually a way to make it more clear to people of how the pieces fit. So I don't really see a big disconnect. Well, and it's going to it's going to tie into all these different areas. You're going to have in the communications. You're going to have you know user ease and um, for community engagement type things and you're going to have the student piece where do they feel like the technology is benefit, you know, benefiting them and easy to use. So I think that technology piece will be in pretty much everything but I think what Chris is saying I like that the way it relates to the facilities and the planning and the maintenance and those sort of things would be what would be falling under this bucket if I'm understanding that correctly. Right. Yeah, th there's going to be a lot of, so, you know, facilities in relationship and technology. Is that we go? Okay. Um, all right. Uh, next one is community relations uh, slash communications. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. So I want to say one thing about this. I feel like something that. Um, I would like to be strategic about is I feel like we, I don't know what the right, I mean, we've done an annual report or things, but uh, a strategic plan of how we're relating to the rest of the community. And I mean, I, you mentioned telling your story, but I feel like we have not, we are not telling all the good things that are happening. And we seem to have a, we need a good way that we're getting our message out. Um, almost I, marketing is a I don't know but that is kind of what it is saying branding actually branding thank you this is what you know this is what district 205 if your student you know this is the uh, these are the opportunities that your child could participate in this is the great stuff happening these are things our kids are achieving these are what our teachers are doing um, so that's what I would like to see under that I don't have a good name for it but no, Kara, I, I, could, I could not agree more because, you know, I know this has been a, a very difficult year for everybody, but there are, like, amazing things going on in every single one of our buildings. Our teachers are doing amazing things. Our families are doing amazing things to adapt and overcome. Our kids are accomplishing amazing things. And I feel like we do not do it good enough job like just being a cheerleader for our community our students and so i i definitely want to see that improve and i think you couldn't i don't think you could have said it better and part of that as well kara is um 
telling the story and helping our community understand these things that we are focusing on and that um, we feel are priorities for us and for the community and helping them, you know, consistently see that as we're making decisions and um, putting new things in place so that every, they all, everybody understands the path that we're on and why we're making those decisions. So those, those are sort of, you know, us talking to the community. And I think the, the corollary there would be us listening mm -hmm. and having more, probably a more formalized channel would be beneficial to everybody involved um, to be able to do that. And I'm not sure how to structure it, but that, that seems like, you know, you have one category about just us communicating our plans, objectives, mm -hmm. and successes. Um, another bucket around you know, consistent and formal opportunities for people to give feedback. And then obviously there's informal opportunities like board meetings and things like that um, as well. So those would be two different categories. Yes. So engagement, yeah. So I'm hearing branding yeah, is one idea. Way. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, so rather than think about branding or, or marketing, um, I think we should think about a, a good, honest annual report uh, to our constituents, to the people that pay the bills. 90% of our revenues come from local sources, property taxes and the fees that we charge our parents. And in this process, I'd like to see us take an approach uh, to add value to our community. And I, I think it's very difficult for a local suburban school district to create a brand, a brand that attracts people. And when you also think about like a dashboard on your website, uh, I think it's very difficult for somebody who's thinking of, of moving you know, to the suburbs uh, to compare all those dashboards and say, all right, this is the best school district. This is where I want my kid. Um, and instead, what, what happens is these organizations like the Niche Group and Great Schools, they take all of the state data and they take a variety of other things, which I would assume organizations like the ECRA Group uh, deconstruct and, and figure out exactly what they measure and how much they weight it. Um, and we're gonna, I mean, we're talking about measuring things. And I think whatever we measure and report back to the board, uh, we're gonna end up improving. So what I'd, the approach I'd really like to see us take is that, you know, somebody's thinking about what, what town do I wanna move to? And in today's day and age, they go to Redfin, they go to Zillow, they go to one of these multiple sources in these school rating organizations have partnered with these real estate sites. And unfortunately, they boiled it down to a number. Um, and that makes comparison easy for the consumer, but difficult for the organization that's trying to generate a high number. I think we would serve our constituents well and serve ourselves well, because I, I think those numbers uh, that they boil it all down to are based in state measurement data. And, and, and after all, I mean, by law, that's what we're supposed to be trying to achieve is uh, high student growth numbers as measured by the state of Illinois, um, high student achievement numbers as measured by the state of Illinois, and, um, you know, the, the standardized test that the state chooses, in our case, the SAT. Um, I think if we were to deconstruct uh, what's measured by these services and by the news magazines, uh, and then I add, of course, add our own flavor to it, but if, that, if those components are what we measured, those components, and, and, I, and I think they're, they're sincere, you know, good things to measure, uh, I think that's what we would end up improving, and... I think that's how we can add the most value to our constituency 
is when somebody gets on these electronic sites and decides where they're going to move to that our, our school system you know pops up as some of the is one of the best in the state yeah uh, that that's the direction I'd like to head in this process so is that how we want is that what we want the student experience to be the the SAT and the IAR well no, but, we we can cert we can certainly achieve well, and have a great think, student experience. The great student experience is what we're adding locally. But the the achievement numbers are are what people are comparing. Yeah, and I think I, I was going to bring up the same issue as part of the academic discussion, um, and I think it's I think having third party data and recognition as part of what we're measuring is critical. So I agree with that. And I think I think what Jim was saying is we should focus on that and then we should communicate our progress, right, as part of the community relations, right? And so I, well, I agree with that. If well. we focus on that, we're gonna be focusing on a very narrow measure of learning that provides us annual lagging data that makes it very difficult to drive instruction that truly impacts learning and doesn't even always accurately measure learning. Yeah. So if, if that's the direction if I, we want to go, if I can we jump in. know what that means. Sorry. Well, can I, if I can back up, I think like we talked about that the state, what they're measuring now, it's, it's, if I recall, it's much more diverse than just achievement, student academic achievement. So it has a lot of other diverse criteria in there and if that's what's baked into our numbers then I think it does have and so maybe we should go back and look at uh, specific the uh, state of Illinois what's included in that um, I forgot the dashboard or whatever it is what's those different facets that are included because I think there's some social emotional pieces in that dashboard there's pieces on diversity in that dashboard there's pieces on achievement in that dashboard um so all of those things bake into our numbers and when people are looking at the real estate um and where they want to move all of those things affect our numbers so i think we might be in a better position um than i believe we may be, but to go back to the community relations aspect, if we talked about two-way communications, and I don't know if that two-way communications is different than engagement or if that's the same thing, um, but you know, if that's a, a bucket that we want to take a look at, and I don't know if there's another bucket that needs to be measured in that um, community uh, relations piece. So I thought this was about how we communicate, like more like the the strategies or, you know, so, you know, so that like the pathways. So, you know, if you're basically somebody's wanting to move, you know, they go, oh, what, what, why would I move here? And there's all, there's all these ways for them to find out the information if they're coming in, our own community, um, internal, external, I guess that's more what I thought, but maybe I'm wrong on. No, I think that's, that's right, I think. Yeah, that's so, how I interpret it as no. well. Like if they go to our district website, what are they, what story is being told about us and how are we communicating us, right? Not to discount all the things that Jim was talking about, but I don't think it, in my opinion, doesn't fall in this kind of bucket. <laughs> yeah, I think it would go under academics. Yeah. I think it's a great idea, so we yeah. gotta put it in there. Um, I had one idea for how to assess community uh, engagement, which would be your share of local student population. Um, because, you know, people vote with their feet, essentially, on their satisfaction with, with, uh, with schools these days. And we've, we've experienced um, what I assume is the largest drop in enrollment in quite some time. And so, you know, I think it would be good for the district if that ceased, and ideally, if we're doing well communicating and listening and delivering for the constituency base, that should come back. So that's not like a broad bucket, but that's something I think would be interesting for us to be looking at over the next couple of years. I 
right, let, let's try to see if we have any kind of um, themes to capture under here. I, to begin with, I'm, I'm hearing things around communication, which are really more about formalizing communication strategies, which is the way I heard some conversation around. And then the idea of branding or, or it, that's really about driving your story in and you know, uh, making sure that that you're communicating what you value and, and what's of interest to the community. I don't think branding is, um, I don't know if that's off the table or not. Some of you had mentioned that. Um, we do often see that it is a good opportunity for you to drive that story. And um, there's probably several things that the, the administrative team can come up um, in terms of indicators and specifics under that. But John, uh, what, what else do you have that comes to mind? Um, there was there was definitely some talk about feedback, like um, you know, patient, right, two three way, right? Like how like how does how do you measure sort of the the feedback coming back from the community, and then and then this this concept of I mean I I wrote down enrollment is not enrollment, but it's the concept of how do you yeah you know how do you track enrollments in a way that might be indicative of the 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 brand that is living in the community. Um, you know, because branding is about, I mean, branding is a big, a big area. We do see it in a lot of places. And ultimately it's about understanding what the community thinks and expects of their schools. And so a lot of times it's doing scientific surveys to, to get a pulse of, you know, what proportion of the community actually what do they think about when they think about our school system and do they rate it of high quality? Do they have really positive sentiments? I mean, that, that we talk about school systems, it's really that, um, that visceral react, that, that immediate reaction and expectation that comes um, from a community member when you ask them very basic questions. And, and that measures all of this other things, the, the stuff that you're talking about, your, your, your communication, your publications, your feedback loops, all of that contribute to, you know, at the end of the day, um, does your community just really speak highly of you when asked? And, and especially when you, if you, if it is a survey or however that information is coming in, if you're able to separate community members that have students in the school district, and you know, extended community members that are living there paying taxes but don't have students in there because that's where you can really see what are we known for? When you, when you, when you understand the perception and the attitudes and opinions of community members that do not have students in the schools, then you're getting at your brand. What are you known for? How are they rating you? You know, if, if these uh, members are community members are rating a particular area high and you know, that, that's telling you something that we have a real brand out there, we're known for X. And is that what we want to be known for? And that helps you drive your, you know, your plans. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting because that point you brought up, um, I think was it at last point we had like 70% of our community, and I'm making this number, it was a high percent, do, do not have students in the school district. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what, yes, yeah, seven zero. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so that was, I mean, that's a, significant number that we have to take into account um, and kind of be mindful of. Uh, we obviously, we focus a lot on our parents, which is very important. We also have to focus on that additional co the community um, who also, you know, pay taxes toward our school district and all those other pieces and can encourage and or discourage <laughs> um, people yes. from uh, coming and participating. Right. You want them singing your praises. You want them, you know, bragging about the district and all the positive, you know, what, what value the schools are bringing to the community. Another way to think about all of this is to kind of think about what are the things you want to be able to say at the end of the day about the district. So, mm -hmm. All of our community thinks we're the best district in the state, whatever. I don't know what the statement is, but if you kind of think about it from that perspective and a couple of things that you want to be able to say that are really important in each of these buckets, we're the top, you know, we're in the top 10% of districts for high school performance, whatever the things are, 
um, that might help rather than getting into the details of the specific measures? What do you want to be able to say? Yeah. Absolutely, Marianne. Well, I think it's also knowing, you know, a good way for the community to see that we are listening through these different channels by which we're having two-way communication, that showing them that the information that we have um, taken in from those opportunities and how it's being applied to the decisions that are being made or things that are being put in place. So I just think it's another, you know, this branding, if that's the word for it, I think it encompasses a lot of things. Um, but for the community to see how we're taking that information from them, what we feel that we hear their priorities are, and applying it to what we're doing here in the district so that they can see that connection. So I feel like there's three things, but maybe I'm wrong, that it's communicating who we are, listening formally and informally, and then um, communi community engagement or satisfaction. I'm not sure. Maybe it's both. I don't know. But is that? I don't know, that last one I feel like is maybe too broad, but. Would the communication piece, Kara, fall under the, like, um, external communication, internal communication with parents in the district, with people who don't have kids in the district, like those pieces? Where would that fall under and the strategies for those things? Would that be community engagement? I think that would fall. Like Bev, who... would you like to share any thoughts? I think I think it would be good if you <laughs> did so, if you are so inclined. Um, <laughs> but I would say uh, my my answer is I think that the indicators would include internal and external types of concepts for that. But I think um, Bev might might. I, I certainly think that you are looking for a way to measure your community engagement, which would be external and external and internal metrics. So that may be a category to give us to go back and work on. Uh, the other in terms of branding, I would have to break it apart, but I do agree with Marianne. What is it that you want to come away with? The feeling of it, the, uh, the results, from ratings, all of those things. What is it that you want told? And those are the things that you would start measuring and looking for. You have, you've given us some concepts, but um, we would have to break those down further in terms of to be able to measure those and put those up as indicators, if that makes sense. So that would be the who that you, that Kara was, who we are like figuring out what. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I'm hearing three things under this um, bucket that I believe is uh, for now being called uh, community relations and communication. And I'm hearing branding very broadly. I'm hearing um, some formalized communication that includes two or three way listening, that whole feedback loop, and then community engagement. And, and may I just lobby for community engagement? I think that is when I'm communicating with my other fellow school district folks, those who do what I do, the title has morphed from relations to engagement, which implies that there is a reverse loop or a continuous loop that's always going on in terms of communications. Yes, and that could even, you know, that's broad enough to include things like partnerships, um, you know, in the community and businesses and organizations. Correct. And that's something that we haven't tracked often, but how many partnerships do we have? Mm -hmm. Scholarship dollars. And that is also applicable on the, the learning side or the student success side, but it's also a show of how people feel about you if they're willing to give to you, your foundation, the dollars that come in there. So those are all indicators as well. Yeah, I mean, I would envision the 
Um, I think those broad buckets are correct. I would envision uh, me measuring that by just the the presence of maintaining uh, mm -hmm. ways for people to give us feedback, both internally mm -hmm. or uh, sorry, both formally and informally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, reporting out sort of our achievements, setbacks, goals annually to to people in a way that is going to be consumed. Um, and then, as I mentioned, I think we should be tracking where people choose to send their kids to school mm -hmm. because that that encompasses all aspects of district operations. Mm -hmm. And if we're doing a great job with the community, I would assume that we will get back some of the students that have recently left. Any other thoughts on that, that yeah. last oh. uh, bucket for, for community relations and communication? Oh, sorry, can you repeat it, please? So under community relations and communications, we're, we're looking at some broad area around branding, um, formalizing communication to include um, listening, the feedback loop, formal and informal, and then a large area called community engagement. Yeah, I like that. And can we just uh, stress the idea of maybe having that broader group listening? I, that is, I think that is a, um, that, that's a very, that would be a very good piece under community relations. That's an important um, aspect that we need to um, have in the forefront that it's a it's an active listening um, process, and then we can uh, send our message out. So I'm just um, okay. sending my if vote for listening for... and including that as a, a formal piece in some kind of metric or measure. If we're looking for another bucket, something related to student voice even though that will appear in several other places, but something in terms of what students might be saying or a way to measure how they feel uh, often. And I want to break it out simply because often it gets lost in the wash or in the sauce of the other things that we're doing, but what do they say about, and maybe it's something that tracks alumni. Yeah, we tend to see student voice, um, whoever that is, capture whether it's alumni interviews or surveys or just within the school year, your, your, your current uh, students. Um, but that, I think as we start to work on, as the administration starts to work on those uh, indicators or you know, the, you'll see where that best fits. It could, we see it in learning environment. We do see it depending on how a communication bucket is, you know, really organized, it can go there. Um, I think it, that's probably not the, I think the most important thing is to capture those types of indicators with, with your team with the administrators, the other administrators, and then figure out where it best fits. Because there, there's so many that are interrelated. And if you're taking action and setting up plans, um, they're likely gonna impact more than one area. So it's not as important as to which area it's in, long as it makes sense, and you understand what it is you're trying to accomplish because it will likely impact other, other buckets or goal areas here as well. Something I'm curious sense? about. Yeah, go ahead. Something I'm curious about is, is we've had a little bit of talk about branding. Do you know of other public school districts that have had success in branding themselves? And uh, maybe able to give an example of what their brand is, what they're known for? And John, I don't know if you want to jump in uh, with any specific examples. We've certainly seen it through just the use of public dashboards um, that you know they're making public for their communities um, to see. But I, I'm not sure if John, if you have any districts and that you have a good example of. I mean, I think there you could definitely point to to some districts. I mean, I think the ones that do it well. Um, not only are they constant, you know. The ones that do it well really have a um, sort of an overarching single message that it always gets tied to. Um, 
and and they're they're constantly communicating they're constantly getting in the papers and they're constantly marketing stories that yeah. try to, to one overarching idea and in and, and the ones that do it successfully are constantly inviting their community into the schools to see and watch and it's like like they're always inviting there, there's always communications that that go out that that invite them to events of the um, of the school system and so mm -hmm. you know I think um, and, and there are you know there are examples of that um, that I think um, from a branding perspective they've done a really good job you know some things that do come to mind John are when when you think about um, you know future learning and what does that look like so some districts that that I have um, you know, been able to visit um, specifically to tour some of their facilities, you know, uh, District 109, some of the North Shore, um, free, I think Fremont years ago did some great new, you know, future ready learning spaces. So when you're thinking about embarking on something new, um, you know, and, and you want to take, you're taking pride in that, a lot of, you know, a lot of districts want to come and see how you're doing it. So, you know, there's probably depending on what what it is, I think future ready learning spaces are very um, big right now um, because we're talking about this, you know, what do we, students have to be prepared for? Well, let's make sure they have the right tools and resources and the, the space, the learning space. Um, so there's probably several districts um, that would be- I think, I mean, I think what, um, what District 214 did with the Redefining Ready campaign is a perfect example of just they branded this idea of redefining writing. It's so simple, right? It's just redefining writing, but they tied everything to that. The, everything that they they put out, all of their work around pathways, all their work around um, um, community service, right? And workplace um, learning, all of that, they tied to this overarching thing of redefining ready. And that just went out everywhere and just it got pounded, redefining ready. Re and there's no doubt that the community around there, so when they think of District 214, they think, wow, they're really trying to redefine what it means to, to be successful. It just, it's because it's everything is anchored to an overarching single idea. And I think that's. You know, as part of a strategic planning process or a strategic communication process, if you can, if you can go through a process that really tries to encapsulate what the district's about in something so simple. Um, right. So I, I help, think you know when I started something. or when I mentioned this, um, I something that I, I think I'm looking for is you know you mentioned inviting people into the schools like social media, you know. It, you know, everything is visual, right? People want to see a Instagram video. Uh, you know, you can look at a picture of a school and you can look at a stat about a school, but I think now people want to know what's going on in the school and they want to see it and feel like they can connect with it. And I think that happens through, um, you know, video and pictures and just a, you know, you are communicating who you are in a lot of different ways so yes it might be a certain test score average yes it might be a certain you know I don't know just different things but you know you're showing your buildings you're showing the inside of the schools you're showing this is what the manufacturing lab looks like this is what all those things that if I'm looking to move here or I'm you know I look at that and go that's what I want for my child those are the experiences I want and for the people who don't have kids here, they can see, hey, that's what my tax dollars are going for. So I feel like there's that piece of, you know, I like that inviting people into the schools so they really know what is going on besides just the stats that, you know, are available too, which are important. So I don't know if that's really, it's a little bit different than branding. Um, not that we can't do both, but I'm just... Kind of distinguishing the two right and, and when you so the branding to me would come into we're inviting them in to see x like what is it that they're coming for what's drawing people what's the great interest because you're known for something that they everybody wants they're flocking to you because they want to see how you're doing it technology you know is another one blended learning districts that you know we're off in that earlier on i know um if you're familiar with huntley school district 
they host, of course, not with this COVID, but they host an annual event that people come from all over the United States. They sign up and they register. It's like a two-day event, technology and blended learning. And it's very impressive. And, and I think they were even surprised that people are actually flying in from the West Coast just to come and spend the day with them. Very similar like the 214 school district with this Redefining Ready. There's just um, you know some impressive work being done and, and nobody would know about it unless there was somebody really focused on getting that word out and they wanna be known for that. They want people to come and visit. And then you know, word of mouth is very powerful. Yeah, I think so maybe the word brand. Who do you wanna be known as? Is you know, confusing because we're not used to that in yeah. the sense of you know education so i think we all are talking about the same thing it's just what we're calling it i think just making sure that our community understands everything we're doing has the opportunity to see it in person really is a part of it and knows why we're doing those things mm -hmm. that we're applying the feedback that we're getting in the priorities of our community and um you know taking that forward with with what we're doing so I'm not sure if branding is the right word for what we're talking about, but I think we're all talking about the same, the same thing. I think we need to take a look at two ways. One, communicating with our own community about how we're spending their tax dollars. And then the other is the challenge of branding uh, ourselves and what we're doing to attract outside people to our community. And, and again, I think it's very difficult to, for a public school district to brand themselves. Um, you know, I ask people who deal with public school districts every day, I consider the ECRA group absolute experts, um, you know, for specific examples. And of the 900 school districts in Illinois, we have three examples. So I, I just think external branding outside your community is an extremely difficult uh, thing to do unless you are going to laser focus on just one thing. But, you know, we're, you know, I, I thought the mission of our school district was to, you know, provide a comprehensive education um, in that we provide something to everybody. I just think, again, the only point I'm trying to make is that's extremely difficult to brand externally. And you are left to, with people comparing what is the publicly available information when they're trying to decide where they're going to move to. So, Jim, maybe I, can, maybe I can help alleviate some of your concerns in case you were misunderstanding what I was trying to say. Maybe, um, maybe you're not. But... Actually, it's more about branding for your internal community than it is your external community so that you can tell your story so that you're not judged by things that are completely out of your control or the, the measures that you talked about with great schools or niche that are really invalid indicators. If, if you're at the mercy of invalid indicators, are you really doing what's best for kids? And the goal is to be able to create a, uh, a story and a narrative that you talk to about your community so that they can understand what you're doing so you're not at the mercy of these outside people doing it for you. So it, it's not ne necessarily about Stevenson and PLCs in this district, Huntley and blended learning. It's nice, I think, if you ever get to that point, but I think it's more about being able to communicate effectively with your own community so they actually understand these other concepts. And we don't always have to be on the defensive about these other things that, that, that other people uh, create to try to describe us. Can, and, and, um, and I agree, branding, is, it's, it's got a lot of connotation um, that we're not trying to focus on. Um, but I think actually every school that I can think of has something that they're known for. <laughs> um, so every school district has something that they're known for. So if I just think about, you know, what do things that people talk about? Um, our cross country team. I mean, that's something we're known for. Uh, <laughs> uh, our music group, that's something we're known for. So I don't know if those are necessarily 
brands, um, our theater group, that's something we're pretty known for. Uh, our blue rib our number of blue ribbon schools, that's something that we're kind of known for. So I think those, it's not necessarily brand as, um, as maybe Gina and John, um, yes, but so what you, know, when they think about our district 205, what, what comes to mind for them? And, you know, some of those items are things that come to mind and if, you know, and it took a long time maybe to build that up, but those are the things that we have come to mind when they think about our district. Um, and, you know, if those are the things we want to continue, um, how do we focus on that? And if there's things in particular that we want to add um, or subtract, I don't know, um, then, you know, what, how does that come into play? So I would give you an example from my perspective. I, I don't think that we ever capitalized on getting the state whole child recognition. I don't think we maximized that. I don't think internally we even recognized what a big deal that was, even though we said that our Thrive D205 was so important to us. So, so to make the connection between what Margaret just said and something that came up before when we were talking about learning environment, if we're talking about learning environment and diversity of opportunity, and we're talking about fine arts, cross country, and all kids having a pathway and whole child and, and being you know, a comprehensive thing where we meet the needs of all kids, we can brand that and that can be the message about what we're all about. So I, I think that um, I think that maybe maybe the idea uh, of the word branding is a foreign concept to public education and so people sort of have a queasy reaction to that term but but I but I, I, I don't know that that if we sort of go back to the idea of common understanding, if we have a common understanding, I don't think that it's automatically a bad thing to be able to, to message that way and tell your story and say, this is what we're all about. Um, and it may be more than one thing, you're right. Like, certainly I've seen where a district is known, you know, for their football team or for their band or for their fine arts programs. Um, but the idea is to decide, you know, what you want to communicate um, and, and create that picture and that vision. So I think, I think we should probably maybe wrap this up and, um, and move on. I think there's enough here to, um, mm -hmm. to, to guide the administration trying to, go, to get some indicators. That sound, uh, sound good? Uh, we can move on to um, uh, getting any feedback on the uh, student success indicators. Anything else? Did you have something? I guess just as a, just as a school board member, I, I would um, love to find out why the most popular widespread indicators of school district success are invalid. And and that's not a, that's not a question I expect to be answered right now. Well, I think that on the topic of student success, which is where we're heading next, I think that we need to have a third party component. And at least from my experience, consuming the different options, the um, the Illinois School Report cards seem pretty comprehensive. Um, they focus on issues like student growth, not have un, not uh, not having underperforming groups of kids you know, all things that are really important. And uh, I, I get a lot of information when I look at those reports. And so maybe that's a better thing to start with as opposed to um, some of the other systems because they, they do measure a lot of the same things. And it's something I looked at when I decided to move to Elmhurst to compare across districts, you know, easily publicly accessible, things like that. Um, I'm also open to using the other ones if that's what we all want to do too. But I think the the Illinois school report cards at least is something that's third party, it's consistent across districts, and it's pretty comprehensive in my experience as well. And what I've noticed is that school districts that do well on that tend to also do well in the other publicly available uh, information also. 
Yeah, I, I would completely agree with that because I believe that's what these other ser these data crunching services that reduce it down to one number right. use as their basis. Right. And so one of the things I was going to mention is feedback on the student success indicators was two things. One, there was there was an awful lot of items. Um, so I'm a little concerned that there's just so many items that are we really being narrowly focused? And second was like I would like um, both what Dave mentioned about educating the whole child. I'd like to keep that. And then I also would like to see 75% or more of our schools rated exemplary by the state of Illinois, which would make us a top 10 school district in the state. And so I would like the academic KPIs we choose to help drive towards that. And the other things we're choosing for the rest of the scorecard on student experience, et cetera, to help us maintain the focus on the whole child and try to do both. And I think if we were to achieve that, that would be uh, commensurately reflected in these outside services numbers. So I'm going to turn it so over to Marianne to and, and John, I assume, will have some information to to help elaborate on why these were selected and how the benchmarks were uh, identified. Um, these were, these indicators were selected based on three big buckets, academic achievement and um, uh, future ready and student engagement, which is what we were directed to do um, to go back to an, an initial question that came up earlier, I think that you will see the, the school report card information that you're talking about reflected in these. Uh, so I don't think that this is counter to what you're asking for. Uh, for example, I believe that graduation rate is 50% of the school report card for high schools. That's one of the things that's on here under uh, stud uh, student engagement. And um, when you take a look at uh, some of the uh, growth metrics and some of the uh, proficiency metrics that are based on IAR and SAT at the, K, at the grades three through eight, and I could be corrected if I'm wrong, I believe that 50% of the school report card is based on um, IAR in ELA and math. So those things that are related to the school report card um, that, that most drive that rating um, are in here. And when we build in a reporting system that reflects equity, I think we will move the needle on a lot of these areas as well. So with that being said, I'm gonna let um, uh, Mary Ann um, uh, walk through this. Are, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. So I'm going to try and share my screen here. And then RJ can tell me if this is working or not working. Um, I'm going to, nothing is happening on my end. <laughs> I'm going to skip over the first um, slide that just reiterate what the areas were that um, we talked about before. Um, and hey, Marianne, I'm gonna I'm gonna present, okay? Your screen's not popping up for us. RJ, I don't know if you're able to share, but it's um, what I really okay thank you. If you can skip ahead. Hey, Mary, Mary Ann, one, they're taking a quick one minute break. Take a two-minute break. They said no you offense to, to you, slide, however, RJ, as they good. decided to do it. I'm say. Sure, sounds good. Yes, I'm sure. Uh, 
All right, we got you back. Okay, your screen's up. We're just going to come back in a minute.
So we're ready for Marianne to give us the uh, the KPIs draft. So go ahead, Marianne, it's all you. Marianne? I am. All right, it's all you. Okay. So this is where we are on the agenda. We're looking at the student success indicators. These are the areas that you asked us to focus on. These have already been covered. A couple of other points that you also asked us to make sure we addressed equity. Um, special needs populations and that we include benchmarks in the indicators. Based on that um, feedback, these are the at a sort of high level the indicators that we've come up with related to student success and the link document, which I think you already have, um, has all of the detail on those um, on those indicators. A couple of points I wanted to make related to the indicators. So um, to the point that was made around whole child, the idea behind the um, indicators as a whole in terms of thinking about students is for you and for us all to be able to say um, what we think student success looks like and that that um, encompasses multiple dimensions and different ways it's to be successful. Um, so that's really an important part of thinking about the indicators as a whole. Secondly, But the general point is that for any indicator we're presenting, that we're giving the user of that indicator some information about what that compared to the um, to historical information from the district um, and so on, so that there's some way to interpret the information. And last but not least, that um, each of the indicators would be disaggregated so that we could look at the extent to which students in different groups are being successful um, equally. So, um, without looking at each and every um, individually, I think you all have them and perhaps have had a chance to look at them, I hope. Um, these are the real questions uh, I wanted to, to bring up. So, what do we say about what student success means? And let's let that frame um, what indicators we talk about and, and how we talk about them. Um, and then, do these indicators kind of give us that comprehensive whole child view that we may want? Um, and then are there any thoughts or comments for those benchmarks? Do they help us, um, again, think about what success means for this district? So, and if there are things that you want to take off the table, it's too many. Um, you know, if you have specific suggestions, that's, that's fine as well. So with that, I'll open it up for comments related to these two questions. And I'll actually, I'll ask Dina or John, is there anything you want to add to any of that? No, I think that covers it. Okay. So I, I can kick it off with, um, so <clears throat> I would like to be able to say two things. Great. One, and, um, that there's- We'll let the board have um, talk, um, weigh in on how they feel about this um, little draft. Yeah. yeah, okay. So I would like to be able to say both, that we have a successful focus on educating the whole child. That would be one. And second, I would like to say that I mentioned, you know, having a very high percentage of our schools rated exemplary by the state of Illinois. Both of those as equal and dual objectives that we shoot for at the same time. So I felt like the, the um, discussion earlier about having a well-rounded student population and maintaining a focus on that and, and 
indicating that that's valuable to us. I'm comfortable with that because I think that's very important. And the KPIs here, like to me, it seemed like they were appropriate because they, um, as Dave mentioned, they do key in on some of the same metrics that I read in the Illinois State Report Cards, for example. Um, I just want to defer to you all on if there's too many or not. Just we want it to be manageable and digestible for principals, for administrators. So, you know, if if you're all comfortable with how many there are, then I'm okay with that. Well, my first response to that is that we're comfortable because we're bringing it forward. My second response is we're comfortable because we're working with a group that has done this before with many districts, and so we've been getting advice um, as we go. And my third is that as we monitor these things and see trends, we are not suggesting that there's going to be, what is it, eight, 13, 13 goals every single year. The, these are sort of the big bucket areas that we want to monitor. And as we see how we're doing, we want to have specific annual goals that hone in on some, some improvement, some tangible improvement in areas. So for example, we, we have some draft indicators that, that, that we're working on for the operational plan because we had to get some of that work started. And so I think that graduation rate's important and our current graduation rate is 95%, approximately 95%. So if the goal is 99% and for the next two years, we want to focus on going from 95% to 99%, that would be one of our focus areas but there wouldn't be 14 of them. There might be two or three each year. So from that standpoint, um, I, I think I think we, we can make this manageable if, if we internally approach it the right way. Um, if we started cutting some of these things out, it, it would be possible that, that you're not tracking enough of the things that move away from just you know, the purely standardized yeah. academic measure. So that's my response, but I would open that up to our learning and teaching people or any comments from anybody else in cabinet. Um, I mean, we did also try to reflect what we heard. You know, for example, the, the special learning um, is, is specifically indicated in here. Um, uh, and so some of these things are constructed also based on, on uh, and John and Marianne both took copious notes at, at the last meeting to try to get these as close as possible to what we thought you wanted to see. Um, anybody else have anything they want to add to that to respond to Chris? I guess you were clear. So well, I, well, the board, to... the board as well, if yeah. the board wants to comment, but I meant in terms of I think my Chris staff is... sort of Amen. trying to shed their their uh, light on it so that it, it's not solely exclusive to my opinion. Um, happy to, to allow other people to comment if they have something they'd like to share. So I'm happy to defer as you all go through the process on if it's too many or not too many. I guess that's part of what I'm trying to say. And I just had two last things and then I'll wrap up. So I would like to see the Illinois State report cards incorporated there and, you know, shooting for a, a higher, you know, let's start with half the schools in the district, you know, rated exemplary. I think we're a little less than 20% today. So that'd be a nice goal to try to shoot for. And based on how I read almost all of these third party metrics, one of the primary drivers of that is avoidance of underperforming groups of students. And that's, that's a great thing to shoot for. So let's make sure our KPIs allow us to measure that, and I'd like to see that added. Thank you. Well, that's, that's where our equity work will come in. That's, that's where our reporting system will come in. But that's also where the, the growth metrics come in, um, where we start to get away from proficiency and we start to get into growth. That's where we start looking at each individual kid. So that's why there's a combination of proficiency and growth reflected in the academic uh, uh, targets. I'm just, I'm going to go back to Margaret. I'm trying to frame what you're asking for. Kara, because 
Mary I mean, presented my was that is not we're under student success and we're under academic outcomes? Or is that academic outcomes, future ready skills, the success and student engagement? Well, I'm not 100% sure what the thought process was. Mary Ann can comment on this. Yes, it's but we all didn't, of those. We didn't want to necessarily break these into three different areas because we didn't want to start to get into to one necessarily being more important than the other. But the way they're currently listed, you've got basically the academics are the first four, six through from academic assessment proficiency to special needs learner progress. And the future ready skills are the three C's that are on here, at least for a start, because those are those we thought we had a better ability to measure. And then the, the three that we picked were measures of student engagement that also that we thought we could measure that related to academic um, performance. I think that there are some other things we can get at in student engagement in the learn, learning environment as well. Okay, and, that, and that's good for me to hear because that's what I was looking for. Um, so thank you for the recap so that everybody you know understands where we are with this and what, what was intended. Um, but that you know this is a start and then there's other of the learning environment that you would look at or the academic environment. Well, the other thing about this is that as we do this, I think you would want to get some longitudinal information before you make too many changes. But but there can be fluidity in this. Like this doesn't have to be what you decide you measure for all time if it's not giving you the information you want. Well, for me, the biggest thing is growth. And for me, it's it's linking what we're doing should translate to those third party assessments. And that's important because that's all people have time to look at. That's what's always published. It's been out there forever, and we can't ignore that. But I would like to see a linkage of what we're doing or show d demonstrative metric performance that what we're doing is eventually moving the, the needle on, the, on in, in a third party. Well, I personally think you're making a great point there because um, – if we don't get growth and if we don't get equity, our t current top performers won't really realistically be able to perform any better than they're already performing to move those metrics. Yeah. That we're looking at all the students, all the populations, not the top, not the bottom, that big 80% that typically is... <laughs> not looked at. Well, and I think if I remember correctly from our last conversation, I know it was a while back, but we talked about the importance of, in every one of these areas, evaluating each one of the, you know, each student population, you know, every student population from our um, learners that are needing more help to our students that are um, in reach and in those programs. So. I think I remember that from last time that we wanted to make sure that those, um, we were looking at those metrics for all of these different areas. Is that correct, Dave? Yes, that will be part of the reporting system is to make sure that we're not just reporting in the averages. The second thing that I think is important is the fourth thing on here, students meeting key academic milestones. By defining those, that's where we can get more sophisticated with our measurement system where we start back mapping um, with, 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 with greater specificity um, where they need to be and how they're growing, which is another indicator so that we can intervene at earlier ages and, and it's not all about intervention after the fact where um, you, you start to get these standardized test scores and, and you, don't, you don't have the ability to try to identify what went wrong and where and how to fix it you just have scores that come back to you after the fact that say something's wrong. And, and you've got a lot of guesswork in there trying to figure out what, what that is. So I, I like the idea of the benchmark because I think that that is gonna be a big, um, a, a big driver of the ability to get to the, to the 
end game outcomes that 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 people tend to look at in, in the the high school uh, that you know you expect somebody uh, you know to fix some some quote unquote issue between their ninth grade PSAT and their eleventh grade SAT, and there's a lot more to getting them to ninth grade than than expecting that miracle to happen in two years. So. I, I like these because it really um, exactly what you're saying. You're back mapping, but you're also we're not just getting a report on data. Like like data's data means nothing unless you do something with it. So I like that there's a real tangible. You know, you're looking for milestones and because um, exactly like you know it starts early and you want to do your interventions early if you can. So I like that. My I'm. Is this manageable? That's something that I, you know, like, is this manageable to the principals, the administration? Because it seems like a lot. I, I like it. I just, you know, yeah. Well, I think it's a lot. I think the initial, the initial reaction that we're getting from them is not, I mean, they, they're looking at these numbers and they know that there's work to be done. So they, they get that. Um, I, I think that, that a lot of the work that we're doing ultimately supports this, and the goal of getting to more specific outcomes is something that I've been trying to ingrain in the thought process. Um, and so when you look at core success, the reason that I think that that is potentially a really good indicator is because our curriculum is now so much more aligned with the standards and our teachers have such a better understanding of what those standards are that if you tie that to the IAR and you take a look at rigor and you take a look at what goes on the school report card, that internal metric about course success means a lot more now, I think, to us than it would have three or four years ago when we, when we weren't able to make that statement. Um, so, so that, that those are a couple of my thoughts in response to some of the questions, but I know that um, John and Mary Ann may have more to say, and I certainly want the learning and teaching people to to, to feel free to jump in at, at, as well. While we're on, yeah, the I box, mean, I... Um, you know, my I I do think it's a lot, but I don't think it's too much. I, I think this is the kind of thing that we should be monitoring and monitoring closely. Um, and, and maybe I'm stating the obvious, but you know, in in a um, in a spirit of continuous improvement, to make the blanket uh, goal of 80% of students meet these key milestones, I mean, I think that's a great goal. But I, maybe we need to break it down multi milestone by milestone. I mean, we've got a few where you know um, we're currently at 42%. Um, and I think it's hard uh, to come to map a plan to go from 42 percent to 80 percent uh, in a short time frame. So maybe we need to incrementally uh, have goals for these uh, each individual one. Plus, there are a few of them like uh, kindergarten readiness, reading on grade level by third grade that already 90% of our students uh, it says are meeting those milestones. Well, it makes no sense to have a, uh, a benchmark of 80%. Um, yeah, I, I think we should incrementally see if we can improve those as well. And, and I think that's, you know, really where the equity comes in. Because uh, I suspect that, uh, that the percentage that, that, you know, is the difference between 90 and 100% are, are kids that need more support. And those are the kids that, that we should be focusing resources on. Um, I guess that's what I have to say in that. I'd like to look at these and set milestones, you know, individually rather than uh, rather than grouping them together. So what I would what I would um, say to that is that going along with the statement I last read, the work that we're doing with uh, our data warehouse, which is our edit system, our principals and our teachers are are definitely further ahead than they were last year at this point with that, thanks to a lot of work that Mary has been doing. And also thanks to the work that we're trying to do to tie this into the MTSS work, 
that, that you'll hear a report on when we do, uh, do our operational plan report in May. And so you're absolutely correct to state that there's no way that, that the, we're gonna wave a wand and get to these benchmarks. So the idea would be, and this is where the draft, cap, uh, the draft goals for next year are currently at, is to take some of these that we think are, are really important, or, and, and I say important, um, each grade level um, and, and meaningful important goals, but to say, okay, this is where we, we're at. So, so you take these and you bring them to the annual goal and you say you're at 50% and the goal for next year is to be at 55%, 60%, et cetera. So we build that into the specific goal that we're trying to focus on for that year. And I think that that sort of meets where, where you go with some of that. I think we're totally on the same page. And I uh, wanted to weigh in, and I agree. I, I like the idea of the um, incremental. And I, I also think that this process will help us understand, and I like the point that you brought up, Jim, about, you know, at, you know, K and maybe third grade, we're at 90%, and then we drop off somewhere in middle school and high school, and I think there's an important question there on why t my interpretation is that at some point in time, kids are disengaging, and what is the source of that disengagement? Because to me, when you disengage, you no longer make those achievement levels. So what's the source of that disengagement? And I think these metrics will help us better uncover some of those issues so we can um, address that. So I don't know if you can hear me, so but then, I, I guess so I'm these are the... a couple of things. Oh, go ahead. It was okay, go ahead. I was just gonna try and summarize, but I don't know how well you can hear me. No, have her go. Yeah, Marianne, go ahead. Okay, so I guess I'm I'm just trying to make sure I'm understanding um, kind of where we are. It sounds like most um, folks are kind of on board with this list. Um, with the potential addition of something related to schools being rated as exemplary. Um, and I think there's some um, question about how we think about the benchmarks and just making sure they're appropriate and you know overall and depending on the specifics of the indicators. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, I think the thing, is that me? Sorry. I think there's the external, um, you know, rating piece, whatever you want to call it, that we want to, cons you know, we want our students to be doing well, but then we also want to make sure we're moving the external rating in a positive, you know, move it up. That was, that's the other piece of this. So I don't know where that plays in. Um, you know, you talk about the I IAR, uh, you know, there's two exemplary cur currently, if I remember correctly. We don't have data from last year. So I guess, you know, the question is where do those external rating mechanisms, how do we fit that into this? I think the biggest thing that's hurting us is that we have to get um, a better common understanding of rigor. And, and because I think that we don't have enough kids in the top two categories, uh, or I should say in the top category on the IAR reports. So I think a better understanding of rigor and truly understanding what that looks like and what the, the, the questions are, that the types of questions are that the kids are gonna be answering on those tests and making sure that the rigor of our assessments, not just our, our learning expectations, but our actual assessments reflect that rigor so that kids are ready to take that test. Um, and I think the second thing is the equity piece. I think we have too many kids that are are um, achieving below their potential because we are not um, where we need to be yet in being able to address uh, that 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 concern. I think those two things, in in my mind, go a long way in getting us where you want us to be. Dave, Dave I can make a couple of comments here to too. Onto the grid itself is just you just added as a line item, you know the benchmark is 
you know, today it's 20% and it's a static item, but at least then it's in front of everybody every time you look at our academic objectives and KPIs, every time you look at the reports, you know, everyone's looking at that right at the top there. Um, they, I, I can make a couple of comments on some of these issues too. Please. Um, uh, as it relates to the alignment of these indicators and some of the external measures that were referenced, whether that's, you know, um, webs, you know, great city schools, or whether that's U.S. News and World Report or any of those, um, the, a lot of it is in here. I mean, a, all of those external ratings are going to pull big on assessment proficiency. They're going to pull big on us on on academic growth. They're going to pull big on um, uh, AP, like the the milestone piece of getting to. Uh, uh, AP or advanced coursework, they're going to pull uh, from some of the ideas of advanced learners. So there is there is a lot in here that is directly related to scoring well on those external measures. So I think that's I think that that's important to recognize. Um, the the second piece as it relates to the benchmarks, you know, setting benchmarks in a, in a school system at, at a system level is a is tricky business because these benchmarks that are listed in this report are system level benchmarks, right? So that's kind of where the system ultimately wants to be. Now there's, a, there's some nuances to this. One is the minute you start disaggregating the data by the uh, variables that are listed on the first page in this effort to be more systemic about addressing equity issues, right? Um, you're going to find that even though the system may be meeting, already meeting the benchmark, or whether the system is really far away from the benchmark, the minute you start disaggregating, you're going to find out that there's schools and subgroups and pockets within the system that are way behind or way ahead. And so the this whole process is built around Benchmarks being ultimately the, the long-term goal where you want to be, the annual goal setting process gets administered through the school improvement process. I mean, every year, the um, all of your schools and administration go through some kind of school improvement process. And it's through that process that you would set annual incremental improvement goals toward that long-term benchmark. And so, so the process is in place to do that. And I think that's the, the, the appropriate way to, um, you know, to implement these things. And then the third piece is, and, and Dave, you mentioned this, but it's worth repeating and in, in, in with a, a little commentary is, these are, the, these are the outcomes that represent the vision for student success that should be reported and uh, ultimately used by the board to govern. But it does not mean that you're implementing more initiatives or that you're implementing more programs. The whole idea of strategic planning in schools is how do we take this collection of outcomes that ultimately we want to impact and how do we think really strategically about how we allocate resources towards a very few number of initiatives that if we do well with those, if we implement them well, it should impact all of this. I mean, that's what it really means to be systemic and that's what it really means to be strategic. Optimal allocation of resources for the return on the outcomes that you've articulated. So I think, I think that's a really important point because it's not, even though your report, what might seem like you're reporting on a lot of indicators, it doesn't mean that you are engaging in too much um, unfocused activity. You know that that's that's the key. Two things I wanted to bring up. One, John just made an excellent point. You'd probably hear less from me about these national and and aggregating uh, data reporting services if I had a better idea of what went into them. I mean, I I don't know what they look at. I I can't definitively tell you that. Uh, I'd much rather focus on the components that are relevant and de-emphasize the ones we feel are irrelevant because I'm sure there are both components in there. So if anybody can help me understand what, what's in, you know, goes into these rankings, um, 
I think that would help the whole board and, and it would help our, our whole evaluation structure. Um, so that, w- that was my first thing. The second thing, you know, in this list, going back to what Marianne was talking about, in this list of uh, things that Marianne had, has presented, um, a, a discussion that we don't need to have right now, but I'd like to have at some point, is if we're going to uh, require or have a goal for our 6 through 12 uh, uh, students completing 25 hours of community service annually, um, you know, the key there is all about the implementation of, of how we do that. Um, you know, it was a, a speaker that uh, Dave brought in that pointed out that, and, and I don't re- exactly remember the, the statistics, so if you know it off the top of my head, pl- please feel free to correct me, but something like 80% of, of all uh, by the, of students by the time they get to eighth grade are, are basically burned out on school. Um, and what I would not want to do is, is through the implementation of this 25 hours of community service, burn our kids out on community service as well. Um, so it's just a discussion for the future that, that I think, you know, the, the key is in the implementation of that. Um, and, you know, I, I'd, I'd love kids to leave our school system uh, valuing community service and, and giving back, but any upon how you implement it, if it's a requirement like homework, you can burn kids out on that pretty fast. Maybe incorporate it into the school day, right? Like there's, I mean, I don't, you know, we don't have to get into the details, right. but you know, I mean, it, yeah, a so you great kind discussion of, ins- you know, for, yeah, how, inspire how, them if this is a, yep. you know, something then you, you help them find ways through, but it's provided during school hours versus you know, all think of it as extra time. Yeah, I mean, so, I, I think so, yeah. the vast majority of the kids in the school yeah. district are uh, pretty fortunate. And I, I think if we can find a way for them to realize that mm-hmm. and that part of being a citizen is giving something back to our community uh, and to other communities as well, for that matter. It just doesn't have to be ours. But you know, using that as the foundation is is a great way to be internally motivated than externally motivated. Yeah, I like that. So, Jim, you know, point. that's a great point, and I think that one of the things we should probably try to do is not make it seem like it's an extra. Um, a lot of kids are already doing this. Um, I was at the park this weekend with my dog. I always try to reference my dog nowadays whenever I can. And there were kids in York, uh, shirts, you know, cleaning up that were probably part of the adopt a park somehow. I saw that on the prairie path in the in the past, and I know that one of the things that that you had brought up the last time we had this conversation is to try to take into account some things outside of school for kids that are connected to other things. So we have kids doing a lot of different types of things, and um, I would agree that. Uh, we we have many many students that are um, uh, over involved, but I, I would say if we just find a way to to be able to demonstrate and celebrate the many of the things that our students are already doing, then then it it it, it, it start it's part of that whole telling the story piece. So I would agree that we don't want to add more stuff or create more stress, but um, I think we could find a way to turn that into a positive. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Like anything else, it's it's all in the implementation. So there, okay, I don't know. Anything else? Just to, the, just to the point about the external um, measures, I can reshare with the board a document that actually goes through all of those rating systems, the great schools and the niche and the Illinois, um, or sorry, the U.S. News and World Report, if you'd like. Um, but beyond that, I I feel like I have enough information from what you've told me to move forward, unless there's anything else someone really wants to bring up. I just want to say, when we talk about communication and those external things, I think helping the community understand, you know, just like Jim's saying to be good for the board. I think there's also a piece of that for the community to understand what goes into those um, scores. Like 
the U.S. news and the great schools and yeah, a, a, you know, absolutely. So that you know, and that could be something that's readily available on the website—an explanation of what goes into that, and then you know, our school. Okay, anything else? All right. Okay, so do we have any written comments? Okay. Yeah, there are 32 public comments written in. Okay, and there were no, um, no one signed in for live comments. Okay, all right, so with that, uh, we have quite a few upcoming board meetings. Monday, March 15th, 2021, special Board of Education meeting here at 6 o'clock. Tuesday, March 16th, 2021, regular, regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting here at 7 o'clock. Uh, March 18th, 2021, Special Board of Education meeting at 6 o'clock. March 20th, 2021, Special Board of Education meeting at 8.30 a.m. March 23rd, 2021, Special Board of Education meeting at 5.30 p.m. March 24th, 2021, Special Board of Education meeting at 5.30 p.m. And March 25th, 2021, Special Board of Education meeting at 5.30 p.m. Uh, if there is nothing else, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you to all of you who are virtual, and we'll see you later. We are adjourned. Not sure if I said that. And to all of you.